Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have a couple of follow-ups on questions from last week's Casual Friday video, and I'm going to show you how I use stitch dictionaries to help me modify or plan a brand new design. So let's get started. This first tidbit is one that's been showing up repeatedly on my social media feed. People have been sending me links to this. I've been seeing it myself. It's just all over uh, the knitting universe at the moment, social media. And that is Knitting Banksy. So most of you might know that there is an artist known as Banksy who does street art and might do a, a piece of art in some location, always secretly in in the at night, and nobody knows the identity of that person. There's a knitter from Syston, Leicestershire, in the UK, who people are calling Knitting Banksy. She has, and it's apparently is a woman. She has been a knitter for decades. Doesn't want to be known. There are few people who know who she is, including someone who works at the local newspaper. And what this knitter does is. In the wee hours of the morning or late at night, she will go to uh, post boxes and she will put these knitted toppers on them and they, they portray different sorts of scenes. And I'm gonna show you one right here. And then apparently they've also been showing up in other parts of, of the UK. It's kind of a fun thing. They're, they're all different kinds of playful of scenes as well as more serious scenes, including this complete knitted World War I statue. I assume the knitting is over the top of some sort of a mannequin, but the entire soldier plus all of the clothing and equipment is completely knitted. So I'm gonna leave some links down below where you can see various different places on social media as well as newspaper articles about this particular knitter and, and her work. Many knitters own at least one stitch dictionary. I think I have more books that I use as stitch dictionary references than probably any other individual type of book in my reference library. It's a fantastic way to find different stitch uh, patterns. You There'll be a photograph of it, there'll be the instructions for, for how to, to knit it, and so you can know what you're looking for and you can find all of the different things that you want um, to put into your own creative design. But those types of books were not always available to people who did needlework. And they would create these books uh, of samplers that had actual samples of either knitting patterns or crochet patterns or embroidery or other types of, of handwork. And they would be put together in a sampler of some sort so they could be used as a reference. So this particular tidbit is a, a, a reference like that, that was put together by an individual person, probably a professional needlewoman, seamstress or, or somebody like that. They believe that it's Portuguese in origin because some of the supporting pages uh, have paper that has Portuguese writing on it. It's a really fascinating insight into what it was like to do needlework in previous centuries before we had the invention of things like stitch dictionaries. And this, this is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. And so I will leave a link below so that you can go look at additional pages of this particular book. It's not huge, they're calling it a booklet, not a book, but it is a substantial piece of work that was put together by an individual person to use as their personal reference. One of the places I frequently get tidbits from is from the social media f feed of Fleece to Fashion, which is from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. So they have a conference every year, a Fleece to Fashion conference, and that conference in 2022 will be on the 8th and 9th of September. Right now they have a call for papers, for proposals, for papers to be uh, presented at next year's conference. So the due date for proposals is the 15th of January, 2022. 
And the theme of the conference is creativity, authenticity, and sustainability in knitted textiles past and present. So they, their description is the Fleece to Fashion Project is researching the history of knitted textiles in Scotland from about 1780 to the present, guided by the themes of authenticity, sustainability, and creativity. Proposals should be research or practice-based and need not be Scottish focused. There's a lot more information on the link that I will leave be, uh, below about what it is they're looking for and the particular areas that might be of interest. So, e but even if you, you aren't interested in proposing uh, a paper that you want to submit, you might be interested in seeing this conference. I have seen it at least once. I know I, I watched it last year, it was by Zoom, and I can't remember if I saw it this year or not, I may have missed it this year. But next year it will be both in person and available on Zoom. So regardless of where you live in the world, you would be able to attend this conference. So if you want to follow Fleece to Fashion on social media, then you could, you could see all of the really cool things that show up in their social media feed and you'd also be alerted when registration for the conference uh, becomes available. This last tidbit came to me from a person called Mrs. Raindrop uh, on Instagram. And it's a, a link to a YouTube video about a chair made from flax. And it's an example of a design that is in the Victoria and Albert Museum in the UK. It's part of the collection that they have of items that are about design from 1900 to the present day. So the YouTube video talks to the designer, the research that she did, but the chair itself is, it's a fairly simple chair, but it has three parts and it's entirely made of flax, except for two screws. And she talks about the, the way that they created this composite felt material and how it was molded into this chair. But the idea is that it's a sustainable, uh, material and it could even be shredded and repurposed into additional things um, going forward. It wouldn't have to just be thrown out. So I'll leave a link down below to the video that I watched, but also to an article on the website of the v &A Museum. I couldn't find in their online co collections just that specific item with more information, but I did find an article about the design from 1900 to present day, uh, about the different kinds of objects they have in that collection, and one of them was this chair, and they do mention a little bit more about that. But After last week's Casual Friday video, there were a couple of topics that produced a number of comments and questions, and so I thought I would answer some of those questions um, right here. One of the questions was about a yarn made from targi wool. So I've been doing this breed study of 30 different wools uh, for the past few months where I've been spinning one ounce of each different type. And last week it was targi and I really, really liked the targi. There's like just, I loved everything about that whole process. And so there were some people who are not spinners who are, who are wondering where they might be able to buy yarn that was made from targi wool. So I do happen to know off the top of my head, one uh, company and that's Brooklyn Tweed. It's an American company. They use American wools and they have their yarn spun in smaller American mills that have as low an environmental impact as feasible uh, in order to create their yarns. Plus they, their yarns use different breeds. They don't always use the same breed. They're not always using just wool from a wool pool. They are doing breed specific yarns. And some, some of them are blends between two different breeds. But Targi is the one that I believe they started with, with their very first yarn. And in addition to, to focusing on American wools and, and blends and having things that are spun here in the US, they also produce yarns that are spun in different ways. So most commercially milled yarns are what we call worsted spun. They are a smooth uh, yarn. It's like if you just want to think in your head, what does yarn look like? 
Uh, you'd probably think of something that has three or four plies and was very smooth. That is a worsted spun yarn. And those start with combed fibers so that the fibers are all aligned in parallel and so that when you are spinning them, they create the smooth yarn. Woolen spun is carded. So the, the fibers are more disorganized and they're pointed in different directions. And then spinning them requires different machinery, requires as a hand spinner requires different techniques, but for a commercial mill would require different machinery to produce a woolen spun yarn. So those tend to be a loftier area. They trap more air. You get more yard, uh, yards per um, gram of that kind of, of woolen spun yarn than you tend to get with worsted spun. The yarn isn't as hard wearing, but it's warmer. So a worsted spun yarn would be harder wearing, would um, be more wind and uh, rain resistant, but it wouldn't um, be as warm. So you have trade-offs depending on how you want to use the, the yarn, what sort of item you're going to knit with it. So as I mentioned, that's the brand that I know off the top of my head that produces yarn that uses Targi wool. There very well may be other brands, I just don't know about them. So if you happen to know of a yarn brand that uses Targi, you can leave that down in the comments and people who are interested might be able to um, find that as a source as well. The other question that came up quite a bit from last week's video was in response to a comment my daughter Nina made about always thinking of me as she was growing up as a writer. And a number of people wanted to know, well, what, what name did I publish under? What was, you know, what were my book titles? I was not published. I worked a long time and I never finished any of the novels that I started, but I was as, as obsessive about writing, fiction writing, as I am about knitting in that I belonged to a local writers group, just like I belonged to local knitting guild and a national knitting guild. I would go to retreats and conferences, just like I go to retreats and conferences in my knitting life. I was a member of online forums, just like I am with my knitting. I uh, was in critique groups and study groups, just like I am in knitting groups. So, so there was a lot of the same kind of activity and community in my writing life that I have in my knitting life. The difference though is that ultimately I ended up destroying my love of writing and I did that because I was focused externally on a goal to be published and to get this, seek this outside validation and to make money uh, and to do that and I was focused on that. Even though I had many, many multi-published friends who would constantly say protect the work. Don't try to chase what somebody, what you think somebody else wants to read or what somebody else wants to buy. Write the book that you want to read. And even though I heard them saying that, it didn't, I didn't keep me from really striving for that external goal. I'm often saying that I came back to knitting in 2005 that I was, had been on this kind of a hiatus for a few years while I was focused on my writing. I never stopped knitting entirely, but I just didn't knit very often. It would be gift knitting here and there. I never went to a yarn shop in that four or five years when I was really focused on writing. And, but in 2005, I, when I came back to knitting, I realized there was a world, a community out there very much like the writing community. There was online knitting magazines. There were uh, knitting groups I could go to. There was the master hand knitting program that was through the Knitting Guild Association. There, there were uh, um, email groups that I, where I could talk to other knitters. I had never known any other knitters before. And so it's my first exposure to other knitters and really experiencing being able to learn more about knitting in a way that I hadn't been able to before. And I really took advantage of that. But very quickly, I realized that the master hand knitting program was setting me up for that same situation I had been in in my writing life, which was that I was focused on external validation and evaluation from the committee that would you know, judge the work I was doing in the master hand knitting program. And I realized that if I continued to focus on that at that time, that I could end up destroying my love of knitting 
in, a, in the same way that I destroyed my love of writing. And I absolutely didn't want to go through that again. And so I stopped working on the Master Hand Knitting program at that time. I had learned an incredible amount about it in just a few weeks. I learned so much. And I had and I'd found this, com this community, which was so important to find. And I had learned how to learn more about knitting, but I learned how to do it without having to seek this uh, external validation uh, for what I was doing. And then within a few months, I th I, it really, I kind of thought, oh, I want to go back to that. And so I, I worked on the Master Hand Knitting program again for, for like three weeks. And then I realized I would get on overload. And so what I realized was I needed to take breaks. That was my first sign that I had that I had that I could only work on something and devote myself exclusively to one thing for three weeks and then I needed a break. So I do that in all kinds of knitting projects, like sweater projects, where I know I'm going to need a break if I need to work on it for more than three weeks. So over time, I was, I was able to protect the work or protect the joy in knitting. And so I consciously think about that anytime I'm doing something that is external to my private knitting, personal knitting journey. If I'm making a video, if I'm writing an article, if I'm uh, thinking about publishing a pattern, any of that kind of thing. If it's coming from somewhere outside of me and what I want to knit, I think very carefully about if it's something that I want to do and if I what I'm going to get out of it. I don't do those things for other people. They may benefit other people, but I don't do it for them and I don't do it in order to seek validation and I don't do it in order to make money. I'm not shunning the making of money. I do make money from my from from the, all of those activities, but that is not the goal and that is not my focus. So that's the explanation for that comment that my daughter made last week. In the tidbits, I talked about the idea of a sampler book as a, as a reference tool in the past, and the, but that today we have stitch dictionaries. So I want to talk a little bit about stitch dictionaries. I'm working on another Christmas stocking. I worked on one like this. Uh, I made one like this for my grand niece to be earlier this fall. People asked me about, is there a pattern? What is the pattern? And I said, no, there is not a pattern. This is one I created for, you know, the Richardson family. I, I've made stockings for my nephew and his family and now my niece and her family. And now my daughter, Nina, and her boyfriend, Sam, have asked me to make stockings for them. Um, these are going to be slightly different than the ones I've made before because they will include names um, near the, the bottom of the foot. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this because when I made the one for my grandniece, I said, basically, I looked at how other stockings were constructed. I went on Ravelry, I looked at Christmas stockings, I looked at, because I had no idea how big to make one the first time I made one, and I looked at kind of approximately how big they were. I read some of the free patterns. In fact, one of the free patterns is the one that had this uh, particular star on it. The rest of these I got from different stitch dictionaries. But I have been asked in the past, well, how do you even use a stitch dictionary to create the rest of it? Like, how do you even do that? So uh, I wanna go to the overhead and I'll talk to you about some of the books that I use, just give you an idea of the kinds of stitch dictionaries I would use for stranded color work, as well as uh, show you sort of the layout of the pattern and how I went about doing that, how I would select something from a stitch pattern that I thought could work um, with something that I wanted to make myself. I have a small stack of stitch dictionaries right here. I would say most of the stitch dictionaries I have are texture based. So you'd use a solid color and you would knit something um, that was like knit pearls or lace or cables, something like that. So, so occasionally you'll see some, some things that have a couple of colors in them. But this is not the type of stitch dictionary where you uh, would find patterns for stranded color work. Instead, for stranded color work, there are separate stitch dictionaries. This is one that I talked about last week when I was talking about selecting colors. This one is a reference book that talks about Fair Island knitting. This is a very specific subset 
of stranded color work. A lot of people use Fair Isle in a generic sense. It actually has rules behind it where other knitting traditions that use stranded color work don't. So you'll have a lot of information about color theory, how to, how to work stranded color work, uh, techniques that are used, examples of garments that, that employ uh, Fair Isle knitting. And then, um, and in this one, there are some stitch patterns that go along with some of the actual sweater patterns that, that might be in here. So this one has a lot more about a technique and theory and how to use Fair Isle knitting. Then you have books like this one by Sheila McGregor, uh, where it's mostly stitch patterns. And they do have examples of and explain something about the history and the techniques and things like that in the in the front of it. So then you get into uh, the different stitch patterns. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see where it says three and four. This is how many rows long the repeat is. It's not how many stitches wide. These are saying how many rows long the repeat is rather than how many stitches the multiple is going across. So you can find really tiny little patterns and then you can get into ones that are, are much bigger as you go on. And these are traditional fair aisle patterns. These are meant for that particular subset of stranded color work. This is Alice Darmore's chart for color knitting. She has one that is devoted specifically to fair aisle, uh, but if you're just looking for stranded color work, these are all of the other traditions. So again, she's got all of these different charts in here and she has these arranged like here's a single motif, here's all over patterns. Um, she will have things that are, this is vertical panels, horizontal borders. So she's got all kinds of, of things in here. And some of them are also arranged based on the tradition that they come from. She's calling these the, the inner landscape, uh, birds and flowers, far east, uh, the middle east. So she's Greece, she's using motifs that would be very familiar in those traditions, like these types of things would be familiar in all sorts of arts, not just in uh, knitting. I have a lot of other books that are focused on a particular type of item, like, like mittens, Latvian mittens. So you can find all kinds of, of stitch patterns in these kinds of places. So you, if you wanted to, you could mix and match things, or you could try to devote yourself to designing something that was aimed at a particular tradition. So this is another uh, Latvian book. This one is mostly mittens. These are ethnic designs from Russia, and these are all focused on mittens. But again, you could get a lot of different stitch patterns that were uh, for stranded color work from a book like this. So in my original stockings, I did not have a name. I, I had a horizontal band that used these right side up and upside down hearts going across. And then I had another small band that was like a checkerboard. For the entire stocking, I have 72 stitches. And I came to 72 stitches for a couple of reasons. One was I really liked this particular motif that I found in a free stocking pattern on Ravelry, which I will link to down below. And this has a 24 stitch repeat. So there are three of these snowflakes. That means that whatever I pick for the other bands, they have to be something that will divide evenly into 72. This is a, an eight stitch multiple. So there are nine of these trees. And so I can get exactly nine going all the way across. Same with the snowflakes. But that's how you divide it. And 72 is really handy because you can have a multiple of two, of three, of four, six, eight, nine, 12, uh, 18, 24, or 36, any of those would work. And so it makes it really handy for something like this. So that's the first step is you pick out things that you like that will lay out in evenly across the entire span of stitches that you have for your round. And then you have to think about what are the colors that you're going to use. So I wanted to use, I didn't want to just use two colors for the entire stocking. I could have, but I decided I wanted three. So the way that I planned these stockings, I've, I've knit every one of them this way, was I have a natural, which is my light color. I have a medium and a dark of whatever the other color is. So I have like the stocking is purple or it's green or it's red or it's blue. And so whatever the color is, I have a medium and a dark color. And then I use a natural as the light. That means there will be enough contrast 
between any two color combinations for the entire stocking. So that was another rule I set up for myself. And then I thought about, I wanted every one of the colors to be a background color at least once, if not twice. Uh, and you can see that I have that here. I've got two white backgrounds. I've got uh, two of the medium red backgrounds. I've got a dark background here. And uh, this one's a little different. This is, it's hard to actually tell, decide what the background color is uh, for this particular stitch pattern. The heels are this dark color. The heel and the toe will be this dark color. Uh, so I didn't need to have a whole lot of the dark as the background and I decided on either side of the heel I wanted to have these zigzags and they are going uh, Opposite each other and so that the zigzags are in the same color, but the two backgrounds are different These are just things I made a decision as as I was playing with the stitch patterns and rearranging them and figuring out what was pleasing to me aesthetically and with stranded color work, you can really do a lot of that work uh, on paper. So I usually use a spreadsheet when I'm doing color work. I just find it easier uh, to do uh, in a spreadsheet than in Stitch Mastery, which is what I use for all of my textured um, stitch, uh, design. You can do color work in Stitch Mastery. I just find uh, Excel or any other uh, spreadsheet to be easier to work with. You could just use graph paper and draw things out with colored pencils if you want. You don't have to do it on a computer. Um, but this is what works for me and because I use spreadsheets so much in my knitting to keep track of where I am, that suited me really well for this particular pattern. Now when my daughter decided she wanted her name in it, I had to find a font set. So I'll link to the, it's a Times Roman font set. And I, I have something fairly large. They have short names so I could make these really big. Uh, and then I needed to fill in the space. And because I had originally, in my original stocking pattern, I had these uh, right side up and upside down hearts. I decided to use those as fillers on the side uh, so that I would end up basically with something that was about the same length as I'd used in all my previous stockings. So I had to design this so that I could read it as I was designing it. Um, but the way that this is knit is you're starting at the, the top of the stocking. So you're really knitting it upside down like this. So when, you, when it's hanging, it's going to be hanging in this direction. So now that it's time for me to knit this name, I'm actually turning the chart upside down so that I can knit from it this way. There wasn't an easy way for me to just flip this. I would have had to redraw the whole thing. And I thought, well, it's just easier for me to turn my piece of paper upside down than to try to uh, flip that in my spreadsheet. That's not a good way to do that. Uh, in a spreadsheet. So that's the approach. That's how you use a stitch dictionary. You have to know the number of stitches, the total stitches you have to work with. You have to know how many stitches uh, are in your multiple so that you can have an even number of them going around. Then you need to just figure out what your color combinations are that, that are pleasing to you. So as you can see, my approach for designing this stocking was to first start with an existing stocking to see how it was put together, how big it was, what the dimensions were, what kind of yarn people use, how many stitches seemed to be um, typical. And then I found a st an existing stocking that had a component that I really, really liked. And so I used that. I stole, that, I stole this good idea. And then I used my stitch dictionaries to fill in the rest. And I came up with what pleased me. And I spent a lot of time looking at existing stockings. What did I like? What did I not like? Uh, was there something that was really close to what I liked? So I wouldn't have to completely reinvent the wheel. And so that's really how you can get into sort of designing or modifying your own things is start with something and then change it. So I'm just getting started on knitting this name and you can see that the first round really has very few white stitches in it and so I'm having to trap the floats all the way around. When I got to the second row right here and I'm about to knit this single stitch here, I realized that the chart shows that I should have knit five white stitches and then two red, two white, and then I'd have two red before the midpoint of the round. I had only knit four white stitches, and then I did two red, two white, and I actually had three red stitches before the marker. 
So I have two problems. One is I'm missing a stitch, a white stitch here. And the second one is that these two white stitches are too far to the right. They need to, to be moved over here. So I'm going to uh, fix this without ripping all the way back. What I'm going to do right now is knit these two first two stitches in the red, and then the third one will be knit in white just like it would be on the chart. Um, and then once I get over here, I am going to fix these actual stitches. Uh, I will come back later and duplicate stitch this red stitch and to make it white instead. I have knit this single stitch right here. I'm still missing this white stitch. And now I've gotten to the point where I've gotten to these two white stitches. So what I need to do is change two white, two red into a red, two white, and a red. Because I'm just switching the order of these stitches and not changing the quantity of, that I have of each of these stitches, I can just uh, change these uh, without um, ripping back. So I've released the two strands of yarn. I'm going to recapture these stitches. Looks like this stitch got dropped. So the first thing I'm going to do is fix that one. Okay, so I have these three stitches. So I need to do one red, two white, and one red. I'm just lifting the white strand on so that it looks like a yarn over, and then I'm passing the old stitch over that one to create this one. And I'm going to lift this red strand onto the needle, again like a yarn over, and pass it over. So now I can return all of these to the needle. So now I have these on the needle correctly and now I just need, need to knit them again exactly uh, as they are. So I've worked the first full two rounds right here and in, in this case I had to reorder those two red and two white stitches so that they were in the right location. I could do that because I was replacing a red stitch with a red stitch and a white stitch with a white stitch. I just needed to reorder them. But right here I was missing a white stitch. I knit an extra red stitch. So I couldn't just re-knit those. In this case, I'm going to use duplicate stitch. So I've threaded a strand of the white yarn onto a yarn needle. So what I'm going to do is trace this stitch with this yarn. You come up at the base of that stitch, pull the yarn through, making sure that you don't pull it all the way through. And then you come around the back side of the stitch. So I'm going to go to the back and then come back to the front like this. I don't want to pull too tightly. I'm just using that yarn to cover up that leg. And then I'm going to go back down through the base of that stitch again. And now I have, I have covered up that stitch. This is an embroidery technique called duplicate stitch or Sometimes it's called Swiss darning. And you can use this technique to just apply small bits of color to an area uh, of, of single color knitting if you want. Or you can use it, like I'm doing here, as a way of covering up a mistake. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.